Before we start, um, I thought this may be quite interesting to have a look at. I think people need to understand what this, what this industry we're actually looking at. This was a job advert in March 2017. It was the UK maritime sector itself. It was a director for maritime. But the important thing for me when it turned out was that it basically said, contributed to our economy, generating at least 14 billion GVA per annum for the economy, supporting over 140,000 jobs directly. And then a bit about the UK dependency on this trade. This is the sector that we are actually talking about. It's vitally important for our, our economy in the UK. But before we start, this is one thing I always get a little bit concerned about. And what we need to have a look at is the definition. So we're going to be talking tonight about certain aspects. And what I'd like to do is basically for us to be able to sing from the same hymn sheet. So the definitions I've got here, just a few of them. Cyber, relating to information and communication technology, ICT. A use case, specification and a set of actions performed by a system, which yields an observable result. That may be a value for one or more other actors or other stakeholders. And what we have here is a thing called an assurance case. A documented body of evidence that provides a convincing and valid argument that a system is adequately safe for a given application in a given environment. It's important that we understand what these definitions actually are because when you start talking to people and you say, I want to talk about a system, one person's system is another person's subsystem. But we need to be a little bit careful here. That's the definition of systems, which are taken out of various uh, uh, standards. The middle one is actually quite interesting, a set of elements which interact according to design. I wanted to err on the side of caution. There was a very interesting case that was given to me by Professor Phil John of Cranfield University when we start looking at a system. And he gave a very interesting one. It was basically sort of a, a, a cup of tea. It requires a cup, saucer, kettle, human, tea, water, milk, and sugar. But where's the boundaries of the system itself? Take it the kettle, assume electric, who provides the power? How is it generated? Who distributes it? Who provides the water? Who checks the quality? How is the cup made, etc.? And actually, who trained a human? Well, I know the answer to that in my house, but there you go. <laughs> you have to understand what's actually happening because the problem is you could end up with this. This is a snapshot of a, a safety management system. And remember, this is only on one level. And what you've actually got here are a number of subsystems which interact according to design. Now, if you try to do a safety case uh, or, on that, I would suggest you'd be spending a lot of time and a lot of money I'm not sure whether you would get the results you actually wanted to achieve. What you can see in the top left-hand side, here, somebody's actually made an attempt at this. Remember, this is a safety management system. There are three other levels associated with this. We have one which is dealing with the machinery side of it and another one with the operations. So I think we need to be err on the side of caution here when we start looking at these systems and define the boundaries very clearly. Before we kick off, I thought... Well, how do we get here? So, a little bit of a background. I started doing a little bit of a uh, look in history. So, in 1839, first the recorded electrical installations. We've got some which is electrically propelled. 1879, we had ships fitted with electric lights. And in 1890, we have 51 vessels. The problem here is that they caught fire. They were wooden ships and there were problems there. Will it give Lloyds, anyway, something to talk about in the coffee shop? But look at the dates, you know. we're looking at 1890 to 1895. This technology, I have to tell you, is not new. This is a ship built in the 1960s, and uh, what I can tell you is I didn't sail on this one, but it one looked very similar to it when I first went to sea. Circa 1998, what we have here is a limited integration, a large number of subsuppliers, but it is a significant difference between the bridge, uh, the way that was actually treated, and the engine room spaces themselves. I wrote a paper, actually, in, in 1998 with somebody called Alistair Messer, and that highlighted some of the current concerns associated with software-based systems, and they need to take a total system approach to PES lifecycle activities. And that was in 1998. Step forward, circa 2010, we have uh, increased uh, integration. But the amount of information now being presented to the end user was actually becoming unusable. 
I mean, Richard was a great advocate. Richard Vai was a great advocate of this, of saying, well, all these engineers are doing now are hitting the button and cancelling alarms. The question here is that the, sometimes on the ship, people didn't even understand the information provided. So I took an example. I asked the, one of the engineers on board the ship, turn around and say, on an electrical propulsion system, what does this alarm actually mean? The answer was, call the CETL, Chief Electrotechnical Officer. So I tried another one, I got the same answer. After five attempts, I gave up. But there were five pages of warnings on an electrical propulsion system where the engineer on the watch had absolutely no idea what to do. And I'm not surprising, in a way, because the answers were on page 84 of a 200 page document. But the answer to them was, call the CETO. The problem I have here with this type of technology is that it's now becoming a hindrance as opposed to being a benefit for the people on board the ship. Step forward, 2015. Interestingly enough, we have an ergonomically designed system that meets all its requirements. There's a single supplier, but what I can tell you is that that ship itself has full uh, remote access into the ship systems. There's two pictures shown here. Are they from the same location or is this moving towards the achievable? Just look at the timeline. And this is one which I thought was quite interesting. So we moved from 1890, about 100 years. We ended up then around this area where we have limited integration. There's a 12 year period here where we have increased integration and off-ship capability. We're looking at a five year period to move us into the complex integration uh, and having off-ship capability enabled. And then we go into remote access and fully enabled on the bottom. The question is, where's the future? Well, there's a certain person sitting in this room may be able to tell us. Because unmanned shipping is set to arrive by 2020, he believes Kevin Duffy, Rolls-Royce director of <laughs> <coughs> engineer. I have to tell you, Kevin, this is quite recent. <laughs> I'll quote, speaking of the marine propulsion during a briefing, the report is today, 23rd of March. He predicted by that date, there will be commercially running unmanned vessels on an inland waterway somewhere. Might be a ferry or a tug. It will be 2025 and beyond before unmanned ocean-going ships are in operation, he said. We're confident about that. If this prediction is true, and I honestly believe it is, we've got a three-year period to sort out the regulations associated with this. And in seven years, we're going to have autonomous uh, ocean-going vessels. If that's the case, there is a massive step change in the way manufacturers, regulators, and ship owners work together because the speed of this development I've never seen it in my 40 years being in this industry. We're moving forward at a fantastic rate. But where are we today? <clears throat> well, all these vessels here have uh, cyber-enabled technology, but the question is, what does it actually do? What it actually looks at in terms of the technology itself uh, can include things like the navigational systems. Uh, we've got a couple of mentioned here, radar. Uh, AIS is control systems, certainly for the uh, machinery side of it. So there's certainly interest in, in installing this technology. The reasons, well, they're fairly clear. I think the reasons that we're actually looking at the moment are listed up here, but the important one for me are probably the, uh, the first three. The ability to capture and analyze a wide range of data, we see that now with a series of things which come in from data analytics. The competence of the crew to actually deal with this technology on board the ship, is it a shortfall in crew competence? Well, if there's any academics in the room, I suggest you think very carefully about how you actually got to educate the uh, seafarers of the future. But why use this technology at all? Well, let's take a little look at the um, shortfall in crew competence. There's an increase in complexity taking place now, uh, and STCW really hasn't changed that much over the years. There's a shortfall in crew competence, and can that be mitigated with the use of expert support from ashore? Well, the answer is yes. And a great example of that is that, that ship on the bottom. What actually happened there, that they had a failure of uh, uh, three propulsion transformers. This was a 48 pulse electrical propulsion system. We ended up with one 
propulsion transformer failed completely. At this stage now, what the, it was at the port uh, shaft line was actually in, inoperable and the uh, flag state turned on a setting and all out the sail. So what actually happened was that the, from Germany they managed to reconfigure the control strategy to allow this ship to actually operate as a 36 pulse configuration. And the performance of that system was actually managed uh, and controlled from, from Germany itself. Now the interesting thing here is that the ship owner didn't actually know this capability existed on board that ship. But I can tell you what, he was really pleased that it was fitted because it meant they could actually have biz significant business benefit. So that was one which was actually quite interesting. The other issue that came across from this is that the, the argument was actually put forward that by having uh, the off-ship capability of the ship was actually safer if some of the uh, human functions were transferred ashore. And I can say in that case I'm showing you here, the answer was very clearly, the answer was yes. Somebody else turned around and said that having off-ship access is no different to a service engineer on board uh, carrying out the work. But I must admit for this to be true, uh, the control of access to the ship system by remote connection, it must be at least as good as the controls applied to uh, an attending service engineer. And I'm afraid that gap is not actually being realized at the moment. In terms of manual control, which is another one which is quite interesting, what happens when these systems fail? Because that person at the top is now operating in that system manually. So whatever your idea of manual control is, I suggest you realign it. Because if that control system fails, that, that person can't control that asset. Those days are long gone. Go on any ship, just try and control a purifier manually, and I'll see you ashore. Because you will not be able to do it. So there's a high reliance on the dependability of those systems actually installed on board the vessels. So before we start looking at the um, off-ship capability, we really need to understand what the starting point is. And the starting point is, if I've got this technology, what is it there for? These are some ideas that we've actually got at the moment, which we've actually pulled out. Is it basically for data monitoring? Good example of that. You've all got it on your cars, miles per gallon. We're going to give you that information. What you do with it is entirely up to you. However, if I then do a comparison between all the cars identical to yours and on the same journey, and I advise you that you can save 10 miles per gallon better fuel economy if you change your driving style, for instance. And that would save you 231 pound a year. Would you change it? Now, the interesting enough is what we call the second one down is data monitoring and optimization. That looks at decision support systems. And there are a lot of organizations now offering this particular service uh, into the marine sector. <clears throat> the third one we've seen is data monitoring, and that's altering parameters itself. The question is, would you be happy if you were driving a car and someone could actually alter the parameters within your system? Well, for me, the answer would be yes, provided I knew exactly what they were going to do and what functions they would actually be left with. Data monitoring, optimization, altering parameters, software patches. Would you be happy if I could do that? Well, speak to Tesla, because they do a very good job of it. And finally, in terms of control of the subsystem or the systems itself, if I said to you that I could actually control the thrust and direction of your vessel remotely, would you be happy? Well, for me, the answer would be yes, provided I had suitable controls and the safety argument itself could actually be validated and verified. But what's the industry actually offering? Well, this was quite interesting. <clears throat> Couple of slides. Wartzilla, remote monitoring uh, and assistance systems. The interesting thing that you need to note here on, on that side of it there, it clearly states possible rectification will normally not be performed from remote, even though this is possible. But the crew will be guided to perform these. Do we honestly believe that the people on board the ship will be able to fully understand under the STCW training what's been said to them? I'm going to leave that question open. Consberg, 
Reduce downtime due to immediate remote support and configuration. I have absolutely no idea what remote support and configuration means, but I tell you what, if I was buying that service, I would certainly ask him. ABB, Integrated Operation System for Marine, they've set themselves up here collecting data, looking at data and analytics. But as it clearly states there, it will be in collaboration with their um, shoreside experts, which is absolutely fine. And finally, we'll come on to Rolls-Royce again from March 2017. They are opening up a remote controlled and autonomous shipping centre in Finland. Look at the date uh, which is in place here. And of course, I'm sure you've all seen the, the, the videos on the right hand side. And, and to me, it's not so f we're not so far away from that actually happening. So this is what the big players are actually doing. This is what's happening within the industry. And this is why there is so much interest actually being shown. I'm going to give you an example of what's going to happen with this ICT if it goes wrong. So this was a, an upgrade to a reliquifaction plant. And this is a gas ship. And what actually happened was the service engineer accessed the system, installed a new version of software. And basically what happened, it crashed the uh, reliquifaction plant and the gas combustion unit as the ship was coming alongside. Or the ship came alongside, and that's when the repairs were, uh, modification was actually done. But this was the report that actually came out because basically the ship went off higher. Upgrade to the reliquifaction plant software, pre-system configuration status audit not carried out to establish a firm baseline. No pre-work backups not made, import procedures not fully documented, and associated risks not advised to the ship staff. There's a technical risk because nobody knew what was actually happening on board the ship. There was a financial risk. I don't know what the downtime is on the ship, but there's lots of notes on the end of it. Environmental risk. That ship had gas on board and it was now vent into atmosphere. And finally, there was a risk to reputation. And that risk to reputation meant that the vetting agencies were crawling all over that ship whenever that ship was actually put back on hire. The, another one which is quite interesting, which is happened in March 2006. Please note the date. This was a uh, Savannah Express uh, hit a link span in Southampton. They couldn't get the engines to go astern because basically the ship staff had actually accessed the system and made a modification without that actually being approved. The interesting thing with this is that the MAIB report that came out basically highlighted the fact that there was a lack of competence in the operators of electrical and electronic uh, control equipment under STCW. What did make me smile was the uh, safety issue in terms of the conclusion. Um, item 12 up there was basically looked at the technical staff, but they were also not aware that 24 hour helpline, uh, help hot, uh, sorry, 24 hour telephone hotline to MBD. I would have loved to have taken that call. We've got a problem, yeah, what is it? If it's a problem, press number one. What do you want to do about it? By the way, I'm heading for a link span. I don't know how that would have gone down, but basically I think we have to be very realistic in the information we provide to the ship staff have to be in a language that they actually understand and can assimilate easily. Now the interesting thing with this is I told you this happened in 2005. The changes which are being put forward to the IMO that actually happened in 2015. It was 10 years before those changes took place. Think about the timelines I explained to you a bit earlier. Are we getting to a point in time where that gap now in education about seafarers is starting to increase and are we going to be able to uh, catch up? So what's the industry actually doing about it? Well, interestingly enough, as far as the insurance industry is concerned, does it really matter whether we have a malicious or a non-malicious cyber event taking place? I mean, is there a difference in the risk? We've got cases here where we've got a significant technical risk and we've got a significant financial risk taking place. But according to Rose, Rose, Norton Rose Fulbright, as it states up there, the majority of cyber incidents report insurers are results of accidental acts or uh, uh, omissions. There is a significant uh, media coverage on cyber risks. 
The interesting thing that we've actually got here is that could an event, which is neither a malicious event or classified as an, an accidental act or omission, uh, end up in a serious state for that particular vessel? Well, I'm going to give you this one. These are not my holiday socks, by the way, so just uh, want you to uh, uh, just be aware of, of that. But the incident itself was actually quite interesting. The ventilation manufacturer decided to update the software on board uh, the ship, and this was done remotely. They updated the software and put the software patch in, which required the system to uh, reboot, control all delete. At that particular stage, what actually happens is the ventilation sh uh, shuts down, the ventilation dampers close, uh, and then they reopen again. We think, well, that's really not too much of a problem. The issue here was the fact the ship was maneuvering at the time. They had three engines running. The chief engineer was in the space at the time, and my ventilation shuts down. I'm not too impressed. The concern here was actually quite interesting because the chief engineer at the time didn't actually know that this facility existed. The chief engineer didn't have to do anything to allow that to actually be enabled, and he didn't know what the output was. So here we have a non-malicious event. And the reason why it's non-malicious is that when we talk to the manufacturer, they developed a process in accordance with a recognized international standard, and that had been approved by the class societies. So they followed their own procedures. And when I asked them about the, the fact that the ship was maneuvering, they said to me, where does it say in my contract that I can't do it? And there was no information sent back to the OEM to tell them what the evolution of that ship was. Now, we all have an opinion of whether that's right or wrong. The fact is, it happened. Now, here's an interesting one. My ship is now disabled. There is a real safety uh, issue taking place here. Let's have a look at what's actually happening within the insurance world. Remember I said this was a non-malicious event. So what the industry has actually done, they've actually put together now this uh, point which is called the Cyber Risk Exclusion Clause, which is the uh, CL380. And in the world of marine insurance, an insurance policy that covers ships, shipyards, the cargo handling facilities, they have over the last 14 years included the Institute Cyber Attack Exclusion Clause, known as CL380, and it was published on the 10th 11th, 2003. There are certain variations on it, but they have the same results. It is a paramount clause, which means it's included uh, in most uh, marine insurance policies. And what I've highlighted here is the fact is what we have as a means for inflicting harm. And that's one which is a, a very interesting term. So in terms of a malicious or a, a non-malicious breach, or oh, by the way, this took me into the realms of uh, trying to look at uh, uh, the law. And I can tell you now, I'm glad I studied engineering because this is a minefield, I have to tell you. But anyway, let's, let's continue. So in the previous example, let's just take that the ship uh, had run aground uh, with a considerable discharge of oil. There was a loss of life. But would it make any difference to whether it was malicious or non-malicious for the ship owner? That's an interesting question. Because that incident that I've just explained to you with the yacht does not appear to fall within the ambit of close CL380, that the software was not actually being operated as a means for inflicting harm. So therefore, the ship owner may consider that it's able to claim under its insurance policy. I would err on the side of caution here that the ship owner should not underestimate the desire of some insurers uh, to pay out if they, if, they, if they don't have to. And the insurer, in any case, may argue that there's been a material non-disclosure by the ship owner uh, that enables the insurer to avoid the policy. Well, what, what does that actually mean, though? Would this event uh, be covered under the uh, H&M policy that the ship owner has? Could the insurer argue that the event was malicious and the material non-disclosure relates to the owner not advising the insurer that off-ship access was installed? So at this point in time, and uh, my research has shown that CL380 has never been challenged 
in a court of law, but if it was, I think it'd be a very interesting case to follow. So what has the industry actually done to try and uh, help the ship owner? Well, they've done this. This uh, particular company have actually, to try and help the clients overcome the gap in, in the coverage created by these exclusions, uh, Marsh, in this company itself, has developed a new facility. It's provided by the Lloyds of London insurers and it will indemnify the insurer in the event that a indemnification under the normal property, business interruption, liability, terrorism, or the package policies, i.e. controlling reinsurance policies, is denied solely due to the existence of any of the cyber risk exclusions. So in effect, it negates the inclusion of these clauses. And subject to its limits and terms and conditions, it eradicates the cyber gap. So from a ship owner's perspective, if they're concerned about the inclusion of 380, then this may be a way of mitigating that risk. The insurance that covers CL380, so we've got the cyber risk, cyber, gap, cyber risk gap insurance, and now we have the cyber gap insurance itself to mitigate 380 itself. Does that actually cover uh, all aspects? Now, go back to that example I showed you earlier, where would I actually start looking? Because it's a non-malicious event. My cyber gap insurance doesn't cover it. It doesn't come under CL380, and I just hope that the insurance people are actually going to pay out when my ship's on a rock, I'm discharging oil, I've lost life, and I've got a massive environmental issue here. This took me into something called the Insurance Act. And as I say, at this point in time, I'm really glad I studied engineering. I looked at the relevant law for insurance. Uh, as I said, it took me to the Insurance Act of 2015. And that applies to insurance uh, and reinsurance contracts ended or renewed after the 12th of August 2016. There was a fundamental change last year. And the variations of contract made after that particular date. The 2015 Act uh, introduced the duty of fair presentation, uh, replacing the duty of disclosure, and that's contained in Section 1820 of the Maritime Insurance Act 1906. And the duty of fair presentation that seeks to encourage cooperation uh, during the pre-contract stage between the insurer and the insured. And the duty requires the insurer to make a fair presentation of the risks before entering an insurance country, uh, contract. So an important question here, do the principles of fair presentation require that cyber control aspects of the ship to be disclosed? And if so, what are the consequences of not doing so? We've already covered the area here of duty of fair presentation, but basically it's one that ensures that every material representation as to a matter of fact is substantially correct. And every material represent, representation as to expectations or belief is made in good faith. That duty therefore requires the insurer to volunteer information without being asked. Uh, and the duty is not breached if the insured does not provide minute detail of every material fact. So here's the question. Is the non-disclosure of off-ship capability, could that be actually talked about as turned as being a, a minute detail? Now this is going to require a lot of knowledge on behalf of the ship owner itself to basically understand what actually functions uh, that off-ship capability actually provides to be able to take that then and present it to the uh, present it to the insurance. In terms of ship owners' options, interestingly enough, talking to a couple of them, that they've turned around and said they don't consider the cyber enable aspects to be material fact. That's what they've stated to me. And they, make, and they did consider that these features ra uh, reduce rather than increase the risk. But I have to say, the uh, ship owner's uh, uh, opinion is really not relevant in, in this case. And the reason is that a fact is material if it would influence the judgment of the prudent insurer in determining whether to take the risk and if so, on what terms. But you can imagine the argument that actually may take place between the, uh, the insurer and the ship owner itself if the ship owner has not provided the insurer uh, uh, the information that was actually required. So is that a risk? Well, again, 
This hasn't been challenged in, in a court of law, but uh, looking at the actual uh, act itself, I think there's some very interesting cases that need to be answered here. So in terms of examples of uh, uh, material circumstance, how it's laid out in the act itself, what process would actually be needed to uh, extract those? Remember what I said earlier, right? We, we have a process in place at the moment to dealing with current technology. But what we're dealing with here is new and emerging technologies where the risks are probably not being identified uh, correctly. The current res uh, prescriptive requirements, I'm not too sure whether that's actually going to allow us to be able to understand what those, what those risks actually are. And here's another interesting one for you. We have a, a, a case here where off-ship capability that can allow control of the system or systems fall within the remit of special or unusual facts, which is highlighted there. This technology has been around for a long period of time. So could it be argued that it's neither special or unusual? And if it was declared as special, then where the special change the business as usual? What's the period of time? When do we get enough confidence with it? There are some exemptions within the act itself. And here are some examples of the uh, exemptions which are actually in the act. But this is a very tricky one. Because would an insurer fully understand the risks associated with use of the technology and the subsequent risks? Now I've been in the industry for a long period of time. And I would suggest that it is very unlikely that an insurer would really be able to uh, understand what's actually been uh, installed on board the vessel and what its actual functions are. I think probably they would be able to do it in the, in the widest terms, such as cyber-enabled technologies installed and off-ship capability is a feature, but not the functions uh, it actually provides. Let's just say you don't comply with the act. What are the consequences? Well, they can be extremely serious for the ship owner. And we can actually see here that uh, while avoidance of the contract is probably the most serious consequence, remedies falling short of avoidance can have very serious effects. As an example, if the premium is only 50% of what would otherwise have been charged, the insurer can only cover, recover 50% of the claim. And given the huge amount of potential loss that could be caused by a cyber incident, liability to cover 50% could be significant. So the simple answer in this particular case is to err on a side of caution. Seek to inform the insurer of any and all cyber features on a vessel in order to seek compliance with the duty of fair presentation. And as I pointed out, this requires a massive amount of knowledge. And there is a, a request here, I think, that we probably need to get support from the classification societies themselves to make this disclosure a, a part of their uh, uh, standard business as usual, because this would actually certainly help the clients, uh, the ship owners then, in presenting that to the insurers. But what are the class societies actually doing? Well, let's take a little look. This is the IAX. And the objective of the class societies itself, uh, I just pulled this up off the IAX website, but what it actually looks at the important ones which are highlighted, the reliability and functioning of propulsion and steering systems. And the other one was on the bottom is operated and maintained in a proper manner with competent and, and qualified uh, personnel. And I think we need to look very closely at this at the moment. IMO are actually producing or requiring now uh, goal-based rules. And we're seeing a growth in regulations aligning with these principles, which is actually fine, and that's largely welcomed by the industry but there's a large number of issues here that need to be considered. More importantly, who sets the goal? And what body of evidence is required to satisfy the class society? Goal-based requirements are seen as being more complex and more difficult to understand. There is less transparency to show how compliance can be achieved. And the lack of transparency encourages regulatory uh, caution. The issue here is actually quite interesting. When is enough enough? and how much money is it actually going to be cost to provide that body of evidence to the class societies and the regulators? And I think this is a question that needs to be addressed. 
The problem we actually have here is that there are some risks associated with the use of goal-based uh, rules and uh, regulations. I've highlighted quite a lot of them here. The interesting one, if I can point it out, many different approaches. Uh, when is enough enough? Because we've been, I've been involved in a project where we thought that the, uh, when I worked for Lloyd's Register, we required more information to, to look at the safety argument. But when you actually analyzed it, the question was, did we actually need it? So a lot of companies are now turning around and saying, and, and certainly uh, shipyards and, man, and ship owners and manufacturers are saying, we have to have a framework to work to. Otherwise, it could end up uh, spending a lot of money trying to provide that body of evidence. The problem we actually have here is that there is no uh, internationally uh, agreed level of tolerability within the, within the marine sector. And I think this is one of the challenges. There we have obviously the one from the uh, HSE was taken off uh, uh, of the website itself. And the one on the left is actually a process which is actually used by, by one, of the, one of the companies. I could have taken many of these and, and mapped them across. But the problem we actually have here is that this, there is no uh, agreed level of tolerability. So how do I know when I start providing that body of evidence that I've actually satisfied the requirement? And I think this is going to be a challenge as we actually go through. One of the methods there, again taken off the HSE site, which is actually quite interesting, if we have a look at it, it actually talks at the top here about risk assessment and management according to good design principles. How are we going to capture them within the marine sector? If we look at detailed design, it still talks again about risk assessment and management according to uh, good design principles. There's also a little guidance from the courts of what uh, reducing risk as low as reasonably practical actually means. The term LARP has maybe okay within the UK and it may be okay within the UK military. But once we step outside into the international world, I think there's a, a gap forming here. Now one thing we should ne not forget is actually the impact that this actually has on the uh, ship staff itself. We know that the operation of the ships now becoming dependent on this technology, and we really need to understand how the ship staff actually interact with it. Now, more importantly with this, we may look at this and turn on and say and take a step back and ask the questions which are up on the screen here. What I will tell you is that a very few ship engineers actually understand that this technology exists on board a ship, and even if it does, we have a serious problem here because they don't understand what functions it actually provides. And more importantly than that, once that access is actually in place, what role is, is there for the engineer on board the ship? And I think this is something which is a number of questions that really need to be answered. Are the engineers now, where the current STCW, becoming engineers or are they coming in, becoming operators? Operations or maintenance, what is the role and responsibilities? And do we provide them with adequate training? My honest opinion, I don't think we are. But I think there is a role, certainly, for the regulators, the, the people like the IMO, who will just set the policy against STCW. But I also think it's important for the manufacturers to provide that knowledge as well, to allow the, chief, the engineers on board the ship to actually interact with the, with the systems correctly and efficiently. I think they do, if we don't do that, I think we, it, it's, it's banned on our industry. In terms of the perception of risk, let me tell you that the, that yacht I showed you, that the chief engineer on that ship, first thing he wanted to do was disconnect everything at all, uh, everything at all, because he, he had no uh, confidence in that system. But the role of the people on board the ship, are their roles going to change in their day-to-day -day responsibilities? And how are they supposed to react when they see this off-ship capability taking place? I don't know the answers to the questions, but the people I've actually talked to on board the ship are very, very concerned about when this, uh, when this is actually enabled, what are their roles and responsibilities, and the question is, the people on the other side, what confidence they've actually got in the people on the other side that are actually controlling that asset. 
So Joe Stokes from, from Lloyd's Register has done a, a, a phenomenal piece of work on this and there are learned papers, it's actually quoted in there. But Joe has actually pointed out that one of the key risk areas here is about in, in, uh, engendering trust in the system itself. I think one of the biggest challenges we can have with the industry itself again is how do we trust people that we've never actually uh, seen. Because I'm now giving responsibility to somebody but sure sight and how do I actually know what interaction I have on board the ship and off the ship to be able to control that particular asset. One of the other big areas which is creating certainly uh, a lot of interest is this associated with uh, data analytics. The question here is what evidence exists that the data analytics collected is the correct data and has the right attributes? And will the ship owner be making significant decisions, including safety related decisions, based solely on data held or extracted from the system? We spoke about having off ship capability for looking at data analytics and um, uh, what do we call it, back office advice, which is absolutely fine. Now, the interesting one here is from the ship owner is if the integrity of the collected data is questionable, what about the reports? Could they be meaningless? And could the results have an impact on safety if the recommendations are implemented by the end user? Could the data analysis cause harm? Well, strictly speaking, uh, that's not accurate. But by itself, data can neither cause harm nor prevent harm. However, mistakes introduced in data, the use of uh, inappropriate, or the, uh, uh, sorry, inappropriate data or the incorrect use of data can become dangerous. What we do know is that the data which has actually been extracted, analyzed, can end up with a situation where the information is misleading and misleading the human into making incorrect decisions. So here was an interesting one for you. Data collected off a ship, they turned around and said to a ship owner, that you didn't have to run three generators when you're maneuvering. But the analysis turned on and said you only needed to run two. So the people on board the ship, absolutely fine. So they shut one of the generators down when it was maneuvering. What they didn't tell them was that the engines, the generators were actually of different sizes. The engines were different sizes. So you had one large and one small. And lo and behold, the big one tripped. The small one couldn't take the load, the power management system. And nearly ended up in an instant where it nearly hit a very significant landmark, i.e. a bridge in Sydney. So the question here is, the results of the analytics and the output of it is actually vitally important. Now, sorry, just to go back a minute, on the bottom right here, there's a, a small picture there. And the interesting thing here, this is from a company called uh, Wartzilla. And this is taken out of the, out of the press. The Wartzilla and, and Carnival Corporation uh, have agreed to a consortium where Wartzilla will analyze the data of 400 engines. Now you can imagine that that amount of information and they un actually understand the baseline performance requirements for that, that system itself, how that actually, actually can provide some benefit to, to the ship owner. And according to, according to the likes of Wartzilla, it's gonna be in the, in the tens of millions of dollars. Watch out for these. There's a large number of new players entering the sector itself, uh, offering this service. We'll take the data, we'll do the analytics, we'll provide you with the results. And the question here is, how much confidence have you actually got? I tell you, I sat in front of a Greek ship owner who threw a report on the table and asked me the question, can, what confidence have I got that the results are, are accurate? What's the integrity of the, the report? I couldn't give that person an answer. Impossible because I had absolutely no idea what data was actually being uh, collected. What we have here is the Safety Critical Systems Club, SCSC. They produced uh, a guidance that recommend that assets be assessed for the importance of data safety properties, i.e. properties whose preservation are necessary for a system to be considered safe. And these are the attributes they actually came up, and I think there's 19 attributes there in total. Now, the interesting thing here is that if I take just one, which is in the uh, integrity, it's vitally important. 
But let me give you another one, time. The importance of just taking attribute to time. I need to know that that information is coming to me correctly. The integrity of that data is coming to, to me correctly, especially if I'm gonna shut an engine down. But do I need then a different attribute of time when I'm dealing with ballast systems? Now the interesting thing with these 19 principles that have actually been put in place, or properties which have actually been put in place, you can't turn around and say one, one, three, five, seven, and nine. It doesn't work that way. What you have to do is argue why they are important or not important based on what you're actually trying to control. Now, Rennie Smith from uh, uh, Lloyd's Register, who's actually sitting there, and as I mentioned for you, Rennie, he produced this uh, graphical represent representation on the evidence that he would be looking for to ensure the analytics report were going to in not introduce a key hazard if the recommendations were implemented and that the safety argument can actually be verified. He identified that the completeness of the data set was very important and that the right data was being collected for analysis. He also asked a number of questions around the service delivery development environment, data analytics engine, and the degree of confidence in the results. So that's what Rennie's actually put together. And it's actually quite interesting because, again, be very careful. And if there's any ship owners in the room, be very careful if people start saying to you, I'll run all the analytics, I'll give you the results, uh, and by the way, we're going to save you money. Really? If you don't understand the baseline performance and the design of the system, what confidence have you actually got this is going to take place? Now, one of the tools and techniques that can actually be used to uh, help to do this is something called the gold structure notation. This is something which is actually quite interesting, uh, something that's being introduced into the marine sector itself, as along with use cases. And what we have here is a graphical representation notation that can be used to explicitly document the individual elements of an argument, and requirements, claims, evidence and context, and perhaps more significantly, the relationship that exists uh, between these elements. What you've got to be very careful of with the GSN framework itself as it stands up there, you can actually end up down a rabbit hole. Again, going back to the case itself, when is enough uh, enough? But believe me, if we are trying to present an argument to the regulators, I believe we have to adopt brand new processes. GSN is one of them. And I would advocate the industry actually use this a lot more than what it's currently doing. So what are the regulators actually doing? Let's have a look at what the regulators are actually doing. Well, the IMO, as we know, um, they introduced the interim guidelines for maritime cyber risk management. And then at the 97th session, that was on the 96th session, on the 97th session, on the 21st to the 25th of November 2016, there was no mention of further consideration of marine cyber risks which I thought was actually quite interesting because it is a major issue within the sector itself. IACS, what they're actually doing is they've actually put together a uh, cyber system panel and they're looking at a phased approach. With, these are the recommendations they're actually putting up in place. But if you have, have a look at it, remote access is actually uh, there. What I can tell you is in 2016, saw uh, a lot of interest from various organizations, such as the IMO, there was BIMCO, Lloyd's Register, ABS, DMVGL, all produced guidance documents, which we'll have a quick look at in a minute. There is no timetable in IMO to address this technology. That's been clearly stated. The UK declared they're gonna submit a new work program to the IMO. Canada, Finland, the Netherlands, and Norway are very vocal. Norway, coastal shipping in the Netherlands have projects in hand and Finland is going to perform a presentation associated with this technology at the 98th session of the MSC scheduled in June 2017. There's the BIMCO document. Note very carefully that this is actually looking at cyber security. DMV launches recommendations on cyber security. Don't get me wrong, these are all really good documents. ABS launches the first cyber safety series, and there's three documents out at the moment. Again, excellent documents, but again, dealing with cyber security. 
And Lloyd's Register produced the cyber enabled ship document. And interestingly enough there, only because I helped write it, I think this is probably a really good document because if you have a look at it, cybersecurity is one element of ensuring that the systems are actually demonstrably safe. There was more than one way of just tackling the security issue there. So looking at the websites is quite interesting because there's a, a group called Be Cyber Aware at Sea. I suggest you have a look at it because that's fascinating. The number of organizations which are now in place producing guidance documents on how to be safe from a, a cyber attack. We know the problem is big. Well, there's an example of it. They reckon it's going to cost, three, was it, two trillion dollars by 2019? But there's a lot of work taking place at the moment in terms of looking at the malicious. But what I can tell you is whatever event takes place is actually quite really interesting because the, the information that's being sent back is based on the competence of the, the investigator. So we had a ship which is run aground. And the report came back and said, dent in hull. They didn't ask the question of what created it. It was actually a remote software patch which disabled the, the, the DP system. They couldn't control the steering. It ended up on the rocks. But I got a report, dent in ship, dent in hull. Well, there you go. We've all seen the uh, NIST framework, which is absolutely fine. Best practices for implementation of cyber risk management. And as stated by uh, Dr. Robert Oates at uh, Mallets, threats from those who seek to harm information systems, malicious users, are well-known organization risks. And there are several organizations that claim to be able to detect and react to a malicious uh, cyber attack. But experience shows that this is extremely difficult to achieve. I'm sure there's people in this audience who turn on and say they will be able to, be, to detect uh, a cyber threat to the industry itself. And I'm not going to go down any further down this route because I say there's lots of conferences out there on learned bodies and dealing with the uh, malicious uh, cybersecurity area. Unfortunately, within the marine sector itself, there's a cultural risk factors, low awareness on maritime security. We've got very complex maritime ICT environment. The governance is fragmented. There is inadequate consideration. Uh, I think we all agree with that one. And there's no holistic approach being applied. And what's the economics incentive? Well, I've just told you, I can buy it. I can go to Marsh and I can get a cyber gap insurance, so do I need to worry about it? I don't know the answer to the question, but what is the economic incentive? And as far as the regulators are concerned, we know, we've already talked about how slow that actually is. So moving forward, and then we'll need to come to the end, it's fortunate enough we're actually in the Royal Academy. Yeah. The Royal Academy itself actually produced a very interesting paper. And the document, uh, the document they actually produced is the one that you can actually see here. They produced six principles. And the principles are up there on how to actually engineer within a systems environment. The document used the term integrated system design to emphasize that to achieve uh, an integrated system is more than just conceiving and building a set of components or subsystems in isolation. And they derived these six principles, but they're not just based on theory. They have been pragmatically derived by experienced engineers with a long history of successful and some unsuccessful system projects. A couple of projects which did actually go well, apart from the baggage handling side of it, which we may all be aware of. But Heathrow Terminal 5 was actually a very interesting mega project. And the goal was to actually increase the airport's current capacity of 67 million passengers a year to 95, and it was a cost of 4.6 billion. But what it used was an innovative contractual arrangement which had the potential to transform the project management practices of the UK construction industry. And BAA's decision to accept all the risks for the construction project released the burden of accountability from contractors and suppliers, thus preventing an unproductive culture of blame and confrontation from taking root. Could this approach actually be used? in the marine sector, question mark. What it did demonstrate, as it states there, that radical information isn't required to affect performance, and lessons can be learned and applied creatively in other sectors. Interesting for Terminal 5, 
look at the other industries that they learn from. What can we learn? Well, Nats, quite interesting. This is another transport-related industry where the failure of the system could have facial consequences to staff and members of the public. They produced a four-part safety argument. We have the railway industry, which is predominantly based on standards. And the principles, if we quickly run through them, debate, define, revise, and pursue the purpose. One of the interesting things here is that we need to get more involved with collaboration. We can't expect the ship owner to understand the technology itself, so therefore there has to be a collaborative approach between the ship owner, the regulators, and now the manufacturers. In terms of thinking holistically, as it states, the whole is more than the sum of the parts, and each part is more than a fraction of the whole. And when we start dealing with this, this is not just a one pass. We have to work uh, iteratively to allow and, and drive out what the safety arguments are for the particular systems, but also take along all parties at the same time. In terms of principles three, discipline process, we're all aware of, we've all seen these V models before, but it has to be developed on a rigorous process. Don't just try and go into it and, and fragment it, the approach. Because if you do, you're going to fail. But what I will tell you is that the procedure at every stage must provide guidance and must not provide a straitjacket for the project itself. Be creative. I have here an example from the GSN again. Work with the customers and other stakeholders. Tease out and define the requirements and then implement them and taking everybody on board. This requires innovative and conventional thinking. We have to be able to break through um, that turns the impossible problem into a workable in solution. And please try not and, uh, and reinvent the wheel. And it was a great one actually from the uh, RA. Think creatively, laterally and logically. And the aim is to deliver capability, not technology. And I think a lot of people forget that. Take account of the people. Why is this important? Well, here's an interesting one. Because this is the Department of Transport. Uh, seafarer projections from 2016 to 26. The interesting point here is if you actually have a look, we're actually seeing an increase in technical officers up by 186%, which is great. But then I've got a drop then of 36% in the engineering officer. For us to really understand what's actually happening here, I need the combination of the both. Because if I don't have the engineering skills, and I just have people who are involved with technical officers, which electro technical officers, I've lost it. There has to be a combination of them both. And the important thing for me is, very clearly, is that the educators have to take this on board. Manage the project and relationships, very clearly what we actually have here. Adopt the processes, not solely controlled by commercial and contractual arrangements. We've already seen what the RAE have actually produced. In terms of the suppliers, Involve them in the appropriate design decisions. Don't, don't leave them out. Because recent projects that I've actually worked on, the collaboration has worked exceptionally well. Declare the system's full capabilities and provide the training requirements where necessary, vitally important. And finally, then, this is where I finish. The cyber enabled ship and use of the technology um, is here to stay. It's how we manage it. That's the important part. If we as an industry cannot adapt to a new way of working, where a blame culture is replaced with collaboration to deliver the capability required by the ship owner, then it's highly unlikely that we will succeed in convincing the regulators that the safety argument can be demonstrated. The insurance world may not worry about the introduction of the technology, but remember, this may all change if CL380 is challenged in a court of law. Uh, and are you prepared to take that risk? I would also recommend that anyone in, who runs ships look very closely at the hull machinery policy itself uh, and find out if you're actually covered. Use an appropriate method, risk-based assessment, use of GSN may actually provide significant benefits to de-risk the projects and provide a method to demonstrate how you met the safety argument. Learn from other sectors and don't be afraid to challenge. And a lack of prescriptive requirements should not be a barrier for acceptance against the goal. Don't forget the human, please. 
I've spoken to many engineers and they're very, very concerned about the introduction of this technology. The lack of understanding is increasing and a lot of them turn on and say to me they're glad when they can get off. We really don't want that to happen for the future. And a word for the academics again. This is about training our graduates for the future. We're talking about seafarers, but it's as much about training the graduates for the future. Please look at what's being offered. And if there's a gap in the marine sector, and that gap is widening, it really needs to be closed. And that brings me to the end. Thank you.